Welcome to Tales from the Periodic Table. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman, and today we're going to talk about the element francium. Given francium is a highly radioactive element, I fortunately don't have a sample to show you, nor has anyone ever seen a bulk chunk of this element. Our stand-in for francium is the mineral thorite. Thorite is a neosilicate of mainly thorium, hence the name thorite, and there's usually a bit of uranium in there too. Some of that thorium and uranium decays into francium, which only hangs around for a brief time. So brief, there's probably not an atom present in this sample, just the chance there may be an atom. An estimation places it as one atom of francium for every 10 to the 18th atoms of uranium. That's one for every quintillion uranium atoms. More on that later. Francium is the second rarest element after astatine. Here we see Theodore Gray's beautiful periodic table. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, Teo has written one of my favorite books called The Elements, which I encourage you to pick up. Check out his fantastic website, periodictable.com. Francium is the 87th element in the periodic table. Its atomic number is 87 because that's how many protons are in its nucleus, and that is what distinguishes it as a unique element. Dmitry Mendeleev published his famous periodic table in 1869. He was aware there may have been elements as yet undiscovered. He left spaces for them in his table, seen here as dashes. Here, just under cesium, he left a blank space reserved for this month's element, francium. Looking at a modern rendition of the periodic table, the squares in green were all elements known to Mendeleev. He correctly predicted these four elements and their qualities based on the elements surrounding them. Turned out, he was right about all those, eventually. He didn't predict the qualities of francium, but suspected there was an element similar to the other alkali metals, but heavier. It was referred to as Eka cesium. In 1914, Frederick Peneth, Stefan Meyer, and Victor Hess investigated alpha radiation from several elements, including actinium. Unfortunately, World War I interfered with their research, and their data was not accurate enough for them to declare discovery of element 87, though they were probably seeing decays from francium. In 1925, Russian chemist Dmitry Dobrosurdov was the first to claim discovery of Eka cesium, or francium. Unfortunately, he was really observing radioactivity from a naturally occurring element, potassium-40. He called the element rusium after his native country, a naming convention we've seen with previous elements, magnesium, scandium, germanium, polonium, just to name a few, and many more to come in this series of videos. One year later, English chemist Gerald Druce, seen here in this faculty photo, let me magnify and highlight Druce, and Frederick Loring, sorry, no photo, observed X-ray spectra of manganese sulfate and were convinced they were seeing emissions due to francium. They called their new element alkalinium, chemical symbol AK, because this element was an alkali metal. They were mistaken. In 1930, Fred Allison at the Alabama Polytechnic Institute also claimed the discovery of element 87. He wanted to name the element virginium, chemical symbol VI or VM, after his home state. 
He also claimed the discovery of astatine using magneto-optic spectroscopy methods. Four years later, in 1934, H.G. McPherson at UC Berkeley disproved Allison's method and discovery. The next contenders are our old friends from Astatine, Yvette Cauchois and Horia Hulube, who claimed to have discovered the presence of element 87 using X-ray spectroscopy. They wanted to call the new element Moldavium, chemical symbol ML, after Moldavia, where Hulube was born. Hulube went on to become the founder and first director of the Institute of Atomic Physics in Romania, even earning a postage stamp in 2016. There was much argument over their work, and eventually the discovery was awarded to the hero of our story, Marguerite Pere. She turned out to be a brilliant and careful researcher who worked at the famous Curie Institute in Paris. In 1939, she purified a sample of actinium-227 left over from the Curie's work with radium. She noticed particles being emitted of a much lower energy than expected from actinium. Perry tested to be sure these decay products weren't from other radioactive elements known at the time, not thorium, radium, lead, bismuth, or thallium. The new element also acted like an alkali metal. She concluded, rightly, she was seeing a new element, number 87. After a couple false naming starts, she called the new element Francium, after her native country. As mentioned, Francium is a member of the alkali metals, which includes lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. They make up the highly chemically reactive column on the far left of the periodic table. Until elements beyond 118, oganesson, are discovered, francium will be the heaviest of the alkali metals, and the only radioactive one. As yet undiscovered element 119, ununenium, will also be a member of the alkali metals. It will also be highly radioactive. Each element has many different forms. For each specific element, the number of protons in the nucleus is the same, 87 protons for francium. But there can be different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. All these different forms are called isotopes. They're chemically identical to each other, but with slightly different masses. The number you see next to the chemical symbol is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. There are 37 known isotopes of francium, and we've reached the portion of the periodic table where there are no stable isotopes. All the isotopes of francium are radioactive. Furthermore, as we'll see in the next slide, all the half-lives of francium isotopes are short enough that we don't find them in nature, except in microscopic amounts as decay products of other radioactive elements. More on that in a couple slides, too. The word isotope comes from the Greek isos, meaning same or equal, and topos, meaning place, since all these various forms of francium occupy the same place in the periodic table. Of the isotopes of francium, these are the longest-lived, the ones with half-lives over one minute. More on half-life in the next slide. The longest francium half-life is francium-223, with a half-life of only 22 minutes. Given that the universe is 13.8 billion years old, and even the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old, all the natural francium has decayed away, except for a tiny bit, which is itself a daughter product of decay from higher up in the periodic table. Francium is constantly created by radioactive decay. More on this in a bit, too. 
What's a half-life? This graph shows an exponential decreasing curve. As an example, let's say we start with 1,024 atoms of any isotope of francium. I chose 1,024 atoms because it's a power of 2, and we'll be doing a lot of divisions by 2. If we wait one half-life, one half of your isotope will decay, and we'll have 512 atoms left. If we wait one more half-life, half of that half decays, leaving us with one quarter of the original 1,024, or 256 atoms. Another half-life, half again as many, or 128 atoms, and so on. Just keep dividing by two every half-life. After 10 half-lives, we'll have about one one-thousandth of our original amount. By the way, notice there's one remaining atom after 10 half-lives. If we waited one more half-life, our remaining atom would have a 50-50 chance of decaying in that time. I normally talk about the abundances of elements on this slide, but because of the short-lived radioactive nature of francium, there's not much to say here. There's really none to speak of in the universe, having all decayed away by now, and none in the sun for the same reason. Likewise, none in meteorites, and not enough in the Earth to talk about except the tiny amount resulting from the decay of other elements. More on that later, too. It's absent in the oceans, and, of course, thankfully, none in us. That was a lot of red X's. Estimates are that at any given moment in the crust of the Earth, there is somewhere between 20 to 30 grams of francium. This is constant, since just as much is created as decays. Given the most common isotope, francium-223, which has a half-life of 22 minutes, this means that every 22 minutes we lose one-half of that 20 to 30 grams, which is replaced by radioactive decay of other elements, as we'll see. So, we lose 10 to 15 grams, and we gain 10 to 15 grams every 22 minutes, which means, over the course of a year, about 239 to 358 kilograms of francium are created and destroyed. That constant 20 to 30 grams of francium would be a tiny cube, about 5 millimeters or one-fifth of an inch on a side. If you could magically collect it all together from the entire Earth, that is. Compared to a human, that's pretty small. Unfortunately, francium, with its short half-life of 22 minutes, is so highly radioactive that tiny cube would instantly become white-hot and vaporize, taking you along with it. If you could somehow prevent it from vaporizing, it would be putting out 3.6 million watts of heat. I've mentioned that all francium is created from radioactive decay of other elements. Let's look at that. I want to show you one of the decay series that leads from uranium to francium and ultimately to lead, and I want to do it on a chart you'll see in many physics books. We're only using a very small portion of a much larger chart. On this chart, the horizontal axis shows how many protons plus neutrons are in the nucleus. This is related to the atomic weight of the isotope. The vertical axis is the number of protons in the nucleus, its atomic number. Since the atomic number also tells us which element we're dealing with, each row is one unique element. Generally speaking, when an isotope decays, it can do this by emitting an alpha particle or a beta particle. And I'm oversimplifying this, of course. An alpha particle is made up of two protons and two neutrons four particles in total. So if we start with something like radium-226, it has 88 protons. All radium isotopes have 88 protons. 
Radium-226 decays by alpha emission, meaning it loses two protons and two neutrons, four particles in total. This means we need to move two rows down for the two protons and four rows to the left for the four total particles. You can see we arrive at radon-222. Okay, this is the move for alpha decays. What about betas? Here, one of the neutrons in the nucleus becomes a proton and an electron, and the electron is spit out of the nucleus as a beta particle. This means the nucleus gains a proton, but does not change its atomic weight significantly since electrons are so light. This time, we'll start with thorium-234. Gaining a proton, but not changing atomic weight, moves us up one row, and we now have a new element, protactinium, but with the same weight, 234. This is what beta decay looks like on our chart. Now, let's look at the complete uranium decay chain. Natural uranium is mostly uranium-238, a small portion, only 0.7%, is the isotope uranium-235. This is our starting point for this decay chain. U-235 has a half-life of 700 million years. It decays by alpha into thorium-231. Thorium-231 decays by beta, remember we move up one square for betas, into protactinium-231. That decays by alpha into actinium-227. This is often called the actinium series, so as not to confuse it with the uranium series, which starts with uranium-238. Actinium-227 can decay two ways. 98.62% of the time, it decays by beta into thorium-227, a different isotope of thorium than we saw before, but 1.38% of the time, the actinium decays by alpha into francium-223. The francium decays by beta into radium-223, but our thorium-227 from before decays by alpha to radium-223 as well, giving us two paths to this element. So that's where this isotope of francium comes from. Just to complete the decay chain, the radium-223 decays by alpha to radon-219, which decays by alpha to polonium-215, which decays by alpha to lead-211, a radioactive isotope of lead, which decays by beta to bismuth-211, which decays by alpha to thallium-207, which finally decays by beta to lead-207, which is non-radioactive and stable. That was a roller coaster ride. There are other decay chains which account for other francium isotopes, but I think I've made my point. I'll assign those as an exercise for the student. Francium can also be manufactured in accelerators by smashing together nuclei of gold-197 and oxygen-18, creating atoms of francium-210, which ejects five neutrons. Francium-210 has a half-life of 3.18 minutes. Francium can also be produced in the lab by bombarding thorium with protons or by bombarding radium with neutrons, but only in small quantities. The largest amount ever synthesized was a cluster of 30,000 atoms. What's the density of francium? We actually have no idea. Some have guessed it's around 2.48 grams per cubic centimeter. As a reminder, the density of water is one gram per cubic centimeter, and here are the densities of a few of my favorite other elements. Here's a graph of the elements from highest density to lowest density. I have a set of blocks, so you can feel density for yourself in my live talks. My set of blocks have a wide range of densities, with the densest to tungsten, to lead, to copper, to iron, to titanium, 
to aluminum and magnesium. I also have plastic and wood blocks, but those are not technically elements. Again, francium's density is currently unknown, but the guess of 2.48 grams per cubic centimeter places it near the density of aluminum. We'll talk about other unknown properties a bit later. It's the most dense of the alkali metals, which I've labeled here in blue. It's not practical or possible to own a block of francium. I'll use the block of aluminum just to substitute. If you look at tables of data about the element francium, you'll notice there are a lot of NAs not available, simply because we don't know much about this element, mainly because no one has collected enough of it to do any experiments. This data is from Theodore Gray's site, periodictable.com, one of my major sources of information. Again, this is just a guess, but if we compare the size of the francium atom to that of hydrogen, we'd see something like this. Like the other alkali metals, with their one extra valence electron, francium is probably rather large. The francium atom is a little less than six times the size of hydrogen. It's probably the largest atom of the alkali metals. Here's its electron structure. See the extra valence electron? This flapping out in the breeze electron is what makes all the alkali metals so reactive. By the way, a picometer is a trillionth of a meter. Atoms are stupefyingly small. Looking at all the element atom sizes, here we see them sorted from largest, cesium at the top left, to the smallest, helium on the bottom right. Francium is probably up at the top, maybe even above cesium, but we're just not sure of that. Arranging the previous chart in order of atomic number shows us some interesting patterns. The noble gases, uh, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon, are seen here in royal purple, and they all have tightly held closed electron shells. These are the smallest atoms in their rows. No, I'm not going to speculate about oganesson. The alkali metals, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium in green, are the largest atoms of their respective rows. Here's the periodic table of the spectra. If you excite atoms, they give off specific colors of light. I don't know if francium spectrum has ever been truly measured, but one can calculate what its spectrum should look like. This is the best spectrum for francium I could find. Very rich in the reds and yellows, with a bit of weaker green lines as well, but nothing in the blues or violets. This would probably look orangey if you did a flame test, but it would be the last thing you saw. Spectra of the elements uniquely identifies them to scientists, as each gives off its own unique set of colors. Spectroscopy is one of the most powerful tools of science. Francium is so rare and so radioactive, there are no current applications I'm aware of for this element aside from research purposes. Disappointing, I know. Francium obviously serves no known biological purpose, so you'll find none of this element inside you, hopefully. As usual, we'll end this talk with Mary Soon Lee's elemental haiku about francium. Last seat, first column. There may be 20 minutes before you vanish. In the next program in this series, I'll examine radium, discovered by the Curies. I hope you'll join me. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman. Thank you for watching this Tales from the Periodic Table program about the element francium. <laughs>